even if Trump won the 2024 presidential election, he would still have to stand trial because these are state charges. He cannot pardon himself from them. There's nothing he could do. We could have a sitting president of the United States be thrown in jail. And technically, the worst part about that is that there is no law saying that somebody can't serve as president from behind bars. So if we had a Republican House and Senate and Trump gets arrested as president, they wouldn't even vote to impeach him. And suddenly we're left with a president who's serving time on Rikers Island, but also running the country. That's what could happen. That is no longer out of the realm of possibility. The probability of that is not zero. There's been a push by powerful teacher unions, left-wing politicians, and most concerning, the Biden Justice Department to silence parents throughout our country. Parents want schools focused on reading, writing, and math, not woke politics. The radical left in our country seeks to silence parents and use public schools and colleges to indoctrinate our youth. They don't want to teach children how to think. They want to teach them what to think. I mean, if Republican lawmakers cared so much about what's happening in our schools, they would focus on feeding kids so we can ensure that everyone can learn on a full stomach. If Republican lawmakers cared so much about what's happening in our schools, they would make sure that students have updated technology, teachers have the resources they need so students can actually learn. If Republican lawmakers cared so much about what's happening in schools, what about the kids who are gunned down in their classrooms? The leading cause of death in this country being uh, gun violence for young people. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in opposition to H.R. 5. I rise in opposition as someone who's actually been a student in our public school system within the last decade. I rise as someone who is the son of a public school educator, special education teacher of 37 years. Love you, Mom. And I also rise as someone who sat on my local school board for two years as a student representative. This, this bill is modeled after one that I know very well, uh, Florida's parental rights and education law. Most of us know it as don't say gay. And don't say gay infringes on in parents' rights, including LGBTQ plus and supportive parents. Bills like this make schools more hostile and make no mistake, it results in hate, bigotry, and yes, sometimes death of our students in schools. Republican lawmakers won't even allow my amendment to be considered that protects the First Amendment rights of parents. We want to talk about parental rights. What about their First Amendment right to fight for their children, LGBTQ plus children who are fighting for gender affirming and life saving care? One of my colleagues brought this up, but this bill focuses on parents' rights. But what about the rights of our students? What about the rights of our young people? Why are my Republican colleagues not advocating for our students? Is it because they know that the majority of young people despise legislation like this and do not support legislation like this that is bigoted? Is it because this generation is the most progressive generation this country has ever seen because they want a world where everybody can succeed, where we see the world through the eyes of the most vulnerable? See, the party is branded on freedom and liberty, but what about the freedom and liberties of young people and students who actually sit in the classroom? None of that is in this bill. This bill is just a vehicle for hate and political nonsense, pushing a chosen wedge issue. It's not about policy, it's about politics. It's not about freedom and liberty, it's about the fear of a problem that doesn't exist. I yield back. You know, there are so many legal issues to discuss, to unpack, to break down. Now that things have moved from the investigative phase into a new phase, the Trump trials. And you know, it's never too early for a little bit of justice, right? So what I'm gonna try to do is redouble my efforts and put out a series of short videos, perhaps more than one a day, trying to take on the legal or pseudo-legal arguments that are being thrown into the public square to try to see you know, what might stick. And when you have a defendant, somebody like Donald Trump, remember, let's not call him former President Trump anymore because he has earned a new title, Defendant Trump. That's what I'll be calling him moving forward. Under New York law, specifically New York Criminal Procedural Law Section 30.10, for those of you keeping score at home, it says that the statute of limitations pauses. It stops running for all periods of time that, quote, the defendant was continuously outside the state, the state of New York. This Ukrainian unit shot a serious bid for the all-Russian record for launching a tank turret at a height. Application by Ukrainian soldiers of the American system for remote demining M58 Myklik, mine clearing line charge, towed by an international M1224 Max Pro MRAP armored personnel carrier. New Russian prisoner says their commanders frightened them with prison and execution. Attention, Finland. Russian propagandists talk about the need to liberate the brotherly Finnish people. This is the party that says that they care about making sure criminals stay locked behind bars. But we went on a little field trip on Friday, led by one of my Republican colleagues, to, to check on the insurrectionists and make sure their tablets were working just fine. Uh, I, I don't really understand why we're playing this game. The reality is that the Republicans talk a lot. They talk a big game, but I need people to pay attention to what the Republicans do. And when it comes to lawlessness, they are all for it so long as it's one of their little friends. But when it comes down to black and brown, which we've already talked about, the city of D.C. having so many black folk, there is a problem. Yet when violent insurrectionists came to this chamber on January 6th, 2021, the people of Washington, as Capitol officers, as officers in the Metropolitan Police Department, as staffers and as citizens, rallied to the defense of the Republic and the very Congress that they cannot participate in as voting members. If anyone had an authentic political grievance against the union, it would be them. But no, they stood up to defend the Congress and the Vice President against a violent mob of rebels without a cause and rebels without a clue who savagely attacked 
our police officers. And now the very same members who have come together today to denounce crime in Washington and the response of the D.C. government that they know very little about are astonishingly many of the same members who visited violent criminals in the D.C. jail and praised them as heroes and political prisoners as if they were Nelson Mandela or Alexei Navalny. What an obscenity and what a disgrace to this institution. Uh, to anyone on the panel, is do you think parents in this country, as they're putting their young kids into pajamas at night and they're tucking them into bed, you think they're worried about public urination in Washington, D.C., or you think they're worried about sending their kid to school and their kid not coming home? As a father of two kids who packed them up this morning and sent them to school, I care about making sure they're coming home. Thank you. You know, speaking of crime, Republican on Republican crime, former President Donald Trump held a rally in Waco, Texas with his Rasputin Ted Nugent. He said the number one national security threat to this great nation isn't Russia or China or D.C. crime, but is an 81-year-old slip and fall survivor in Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. I'm just wondering if you know, we're gonna find time in between you know, some folks here attending the next rally to celebrating Timothy McVeigh, if we're gonna find time to hold a hearing on mass murder in schools. When are we having that hearing? We wanna talk about crime. And saying that you support the police or funding the police doesn't change the fact that there is a lack of police officers here because they don't feel the support here in the city. And we're not here to talk about anecdotes. The anecdotes are indeed grim, lurid, shocking. Here, I'll give you a few more. Man arrested after pistol whipping, carjacking. Man in custody after carjacking woman at gunpoint. Police arrest two juveniles on suspicion of carjacking after pursuit. 18-year-old arrested in carjacking mother at gunpoint in front of a child. Searching for a person of interest in a double homicide. And police department lookout tweets. Conducting a shooting investigation. Please avoid the area. I've been placed on lockdown due to a shooting in the area. Terrible. All of it. We should disenfranchise the people in this community, right? The people of Bakersfield, California, where I just took all these headlines from just by going online, which is represented by Speaker Kevin McCarthy. What an absurd way to think about legislating, to read a bunch of headlines and then think that that's some kind of principled analysis of a problem. There is a kind of rough justice here because it's deeply ironic that a person who spent a good part of his four years in the White House trying to weaponize the Justice Department against his political enemies mm -hmm. is now saying he's the victim of persecution. It's sort of what comes around goes around, Mr. Trump. So you agree that the Justice Department was weaponized under the Trump administration? I, I, I can attest to it personally. I don't need to look at other stories. What do you mean by that? Well, when uh, uh, Trump and his lawyers in the White House and in the Justice Department brought both a civil and a criminal case against me mm -hmm. for yeah. publishing a book that didn't go through the pre-publication review process, when they know that it had been cleared in the regular order, that's, that is abusing the Justice Department. And there are plenty of other examples besides. The former Trump Attorney General Bill Barr spoke about the indictment in an interview Friday. I want to hear what he had to say. It's the uh, archetypal uh, abuse of the prosecutorial function to engage in uh, a political hit job. And legally, I think it's, uh, it's uh, from what I understand, it's, uh, it's a pathetically weak case. You just told us that Alvin Bragg is not overtly political. That's the exact opposite impression from the former attorney general. Yeah, well, there are a lot of people think the former attorney general was overtly political and weaponized the Justice Department, so it's, it's a little bit rich to hear him calling someone else political. And as Jesse Waters said, and Jesse Waters is definitely not your average run-of-the-mill moderate American, even Jesse Waters has slammed these investigations as being a sham, saying this, I haven't seen a single guy sweating under the bright lights. Are we going to drill down on anything? Are we going to see anybody squirm and cough up the truth or at least plead the fifth or something so that we can start showering these goons with subpoenas? Where are the bombshells? Have the investigations even started? Actually, yeah, Jesse, they have. In fact, the weaponization of the government committee's hearings, they're so far along, they've already released a preliminary report. They did that last week, and I'm sure nobody heard about it because the preliminary report actually confirms that the government has not, in fact, been weaponized against conservatives. That's why Jim Jordan wasn't out there hyping it up and talking about it. They're required to release the report, so they did it, again, last Friday, super quietly, so nobody noticed. That's how ineffective these Republican hearings have been. And the funny part is that this is exactly what Republicans a year ago were predicting. This time last year, I was sitting right here doing segments right here on Ring of Fire, talking about the fact that Republicans were out there trying to back off people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates, telling them that, no, if we win the House, you're not going to spend all your time investigating. That was coming from Kevin McCarthy himself, by the way. And Kevin McCarthy and his aides and other Republicans had said to the media, listen, if we spend the next two years doing nothing but investigations and not doing work, we're going to pay for it in 2024. But then you had the speaker debacle. Kevin McCarthy makes all the concessions, gives these idiot Republicans all the power. They use all of that power to do nothing except investigations. And here we are, three months in, and as Jesse Waters put it, where are the bombshells? I had said from the beginning, I have no problem with Republicans investigating everything under the sun, and I stand by that claim. And I stand by that claim because of these new reports. This is exactly what we knew was going to happen. It's exactly what I predicted. So keep investigating. Worst case scenario, you find out somebody committed a crime. Oh, no, then we have to arrest them. Good! I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democrat. If you committed a crime, go through the justice system. I'm not so tribal that I can't say, good, get the criminals out of D.C., right? But you're also not going to find any. So keep going because you're pissing off the public, you're showing that you don't know how to govern, and you're costing yourselves 2024 already. Mr. Chu, can you direct your attention to the screen, please? Hey. 
got a bag of great value tots here. Gonna see if we can't put this in my... All right, welcome back to the tater tot princess, the old potato queen. I got a bag of russet potatoes here. I'm gonna see what I can do, see if I can't get in a little bit of trouble. Oh, yeah, yeah, get out in there! Oh. Mr. Show, I'd like to direct your attention to the screen for a short video, if you don't mind. And with that, I yield back. 